Hi, everyone. This is your host, Greg Myers, and this episode is part of our special series focused on diversity and inclusion. In this series, I'll be talking with leaders in the payments industry and maybe some experts from outside of the industry about diversity and inclusion. It has been proven that a diverse workforce and diverse management team leads to increased creativity, better decision making, reduced employee turnover, and increased profit, as well as many other benefits that we'll be talking about. This special series is brought to you by WNET and PaySafe. WNET, or the Women's Network and Electronic Transactions, is celebrating 15 years of helping women achieve greater personal success, influence, and professional parity in the payments industry. WNET is a not-for-profit organization with a mission of creating a stronger and more diverse industry by empowering and investing in women. Learn how at WNETonline.org. PaySafe is a leading global specialized payment provider. They've been driving innovation in and around payments for over 20 years all over the globe for both businesses and consumers. PaySafe believes diversity and inclusion is not just a checkbox, but rather a journey in which they are fully committed to being on around the world. Learn more at PaySafe.com. I'm honored to be joined on the eighth episode of our special series on DNI by Andrew Greening, the managing partner of Greenings International. Andrew Greening has been a pioneer in the executive search industry for over 30 years. Andrew has disrupted and challenged the possible for cross-border executive search and talent acquisition, from turning around international offices and acquisitions to building out new methodologies for client success. Andrew's global network is driven by his interest and passion for people, helping to further careers and being fully invested in his clients. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Andrew. Welcome to this special series of the Leaders in Payments podcast about diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much for being here. Greg, very nice to meet you. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to joining the uh, conversation. Absolutely. So tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, a few things like that. Yeah, sure. So I'm British. No surprises there. Grew up in the UK in the city of Bath. My father was in human resources, so there's been a bit of a theme there, I guess. I think probably also to say I, my sensitivity and support for diversity and inclusion came at a very early age. I've always been competitive and disruptive, I guess. Keen sportsman, led many teams to unexpected results. I think as I look at my career in preparation for this, yeah, I was lucky I went to private school, so I got a good start in life. But I think after that, all of my career choices have always broken with convention. And I think that's shaped a lot of my thinking and a lot of openness to considering people that have come up different routes, shall we say. I was only one of two people in my year group, for example, that chose not to go to university, although I had offers. I was very driven and competitive at that time in my life, and I wanted to get out and earn. So I joined the bank. I joined NatWest Bank in in London, and I got my professional learning along the way through Institute of Bankers and London Business School. But in those early days, it was just a bit of a race for me. It was a challenge. I wanted to get into business, and I kind of had a clock ticking that said when my friends came out of university four years later, I wanted to make sure that I was ahead of them. Um, maybe a bit immature at that stage, but it's kind of been an ongoing theme, I think, in terms of just bucking the trends a bit. Some early diversity and inclusion stuff, there'll be a couple of points. I'll come back to Nat West on this, but my early days in that bank in, in London, probably because of my father's background and my orientation to it, I wanted to get into HR. Love people, enjoyed the city, but, but wanted to get into the bank's HR. And for three appraisals in a row, I asked for that move. And I was told that I was a fast track, high potential. And there I thought I should focus on the business and not pursue a career in HR. When I look back on that, I wonder whether people like me wanting to get into that space and being denied it is contributing to why we have potentially issues around talent management and development. I guess it was the first thing where I I felt a resistance to a path that I wanted to go on. So I left the bank and I did pursue my career in people. I was the first of a generation to look at building a career in search from my early 20s. So I joined Norman Broadbent and again, unconventionally, was the first person to join that firm without an MBA or without a degree. It went very well. I was successful and I got headhunted whilst on a trip to the US, in fact, by the head of the FS practice at Corn Ferry, effectively to run their Luxembourg office. 
And again, in my late 20s, 30s, got into the top 15 globally as a performer for consecutive years at Corn Ferry and was then approached by my former boss from Norman Broadbent to join three other guys and go by Odgers in 1998. So again, in bucking that trend, building a career in exact search at 32, I was the youngest owner of a major search firm in Europe. And I think that's enabled me to bring a very different perspective to career paths, which has not only affected the way I've driven my own career, but how I've looked at other people that are ambitious and trying to break new ground. Domestically, married for 30 years this year, have a daughter, and we spend time between our homes in the UK and Canada. We also lived as a family in Luxembourg for a period of time. Okay, great. So let's discuss Greenings International. Tell the audience what the company does and your role there. Sure. So look, although I, at a very early stage, gone to London, prestigious search firm working in Mayfair, I made it a very short shrift after returning to the UK, felt quite constrained by the old school approach of those larger firms, the Black Book Network the closed mindset, I think. And I was beginning then, although we weren't using those sort of words, but I guess I was beginning to become a bit of a disruptor. I'd had an early career experience as well of working with Galileo, the international airline reservation business, which had really opened my eyes to working in truly cosmopolitan multinational teams, people coming in from all over the world, working on growing this enormous distribution uh, software system. And so Greenings really, for me, was an answer to how we could execute in a borderless world. I spent time very much working for global firms in local regions, and I'd seen the constraints of that from a client's perspective. So Greenings was very much launched to see whether we could actually work transatlantically, which was the primary aim. And as we then gone on in other years to work in further geographies beyond going east. So Greenings is a disruptive play in the payments and fintech space. We've been in that space now for nearly 20 years. We've clients across the US, about 80% of our client base is American, and half of the client base is private equity. So we're helping with a lot of disruption that's occurring in some fairly traditional parts of financial services. I've always loved search, so to this day I still run my own searches. I guess COVID has given me a chance for a bit of reflection. And so I'm looking to take the business to the next stage of growth and move into more of a coach mode this year, driving a younger team in the US and in Europe and looking really at what's coming next. What are the big issues around talent resourcing and diversity inclusion, mobility and all of those things are very important. So I'm taking more time to look at those. Okay, great. So as you mentioned in this series is about diversity and inclusion. And part of my goal with creating this series was to get different perspectives and making sure we don't just talk about it from, you know, what does just a typical payments company do? I wanted a broader view. So I'd love to hear your perspective as someone who's in the search field as one thing that makes you different than other guests. And then also being that you're placing people at the executive level and the international aspect of it, I I think is what's going to be interesting in this discussion. So let's just kind of start out at the basics. And how would you describe D&I or diversity and inclusion, like at the 50,000 foot level? What does it mean to you? How do you define it? I think most simply, for so from a diversity perspective, for me, it's a broad representation representation by gender, ethnicity, qualifications, age, and social background. I think it's looking to consider all of those areas. Inclusion for me, I think, is primarily recognized as individuals being able to give a contribution, having some sort of access, necessary platform for being heard, being listened to, and being considered. Coming back to my Nat West days, actually, my first boss, Angela Sheen, was the head of women in banking. At that point, she was the most senior lady in one of the top three banks in the UK. And I was taken along to a lot of the meetings that she would address in financial services. And I think, although we weren't talking about diversity inclusion in those headline terms at that point, to Angela, it was very much helping the youngsters coming into an industry to understand the routes to how they could be heard, how they could become more visible, and as they became leaders, how they made sure that they had a very broad church and an open mind to people that they were recruiting. So she was formative for me in my early 80s of 
a very early understanding of what has latterly become DNI. Okay. And obviously, you're helping companies find the very best talent, usually at a pretty senior level. What do your clients talk about when it comes to DNI, or what do you hear from them about DNI? I'm seeing in the last kind of five years, I guess, three to five years, I'm seeing more direction and clarity on a company's culture and what DNI means to them. So we're seeing more and more of that articulated. My observation, however, would be that it's a very uneven playing field. So I think some of the differences come around through company status. There's a marked difference, in my view, between what you see, both in terms of a sense of urgency to move down that path with clear evidence around implementing DNI, see a great difference between listed businesses, between those in the public sector, not for profit, and also private organizations. So I think how the company is listed, its size has some bearing. I think regulation has also had a big impact here. I think board composition has been under the microscope now for some time from a responsibility perspective. But I think it's been the first area that I've seen really move with a marked change to the diversity and inclusion of the makeup of those boards. So I actually see a lot of evidence of regulation actually having helped in that regard. I do think, and maybe it's since 2008 with the business and financial pressures, there is a bit of a tendency for management when they're under pressure to work with who they know and who they feel comfortable with. And I think without HR influencing this topic, there's a natural deferral to making safe choices rather than the time and investment required to maybe go through a rigorous and more broader selection process. So I think Financial pressures, time pressures can have a bearing on this. I think also priorities. There's a big pressure on costs of hiring. Limited experience of HR professionals in some of those jobs means that in some instances, there's also limited guidance and buy-in for making a more diverse selection. So I think it's this comes right from the top. Where are the priorities? How are they being communicated? And are they put into an executable fashion? So My feeling around clients' experiences at the moment, and unless companies are investing the time and resources to deliver new models around this, nothing is going to change. I think there's a tendency for the UK and the US organizations, and this is a bit of a sweeping generalization, but it feels more of a US-UK thing. We're still too price-driven, and there's not enough emphasis in the quality of delivery, validated testing in the processes that the internal talent teams are going through. Right. So how prescriptive are your clients? Like, do they do they send you their policy and say you have to follow this and there's DNI aspects in that policy or has it even gotten to that point? No, we're not sent that level of direction at the moment. Again, I think that the variance I see is, is somewhat geographic. And also coming back to the status of the organization in terms of what sort of scale of organization and listing does it have, perhaps. I think, you know, in in many companies, we've seen fairly clear direction around the gender balance for the last several years. But I think there's less, well, there certainly is less direction at all around the ethnicity, social background, and maybe a methodology to open that up is not something that we're seeing in a prescriptive form. I think there is, however, a risk where we're seeing it at more junior levels, a tightening around the role person specifications. And my worry there is that, and I think this sometimes comes down to, again, inexperienced internal talent HR professionals adhering or asking management to adhere very strictly to a role person spec. And if it's too rigid in terms of either the educational qualification, I think this can lead to a kind of harsh and inflexible screening, which is excluding an awful lot of potentially diverse talent that could actually enrich the environment. So I guess if I was seeing anything that was prescriptive that we push back against, it would be the tendency to exclude based on educational background. And again, I think the educational background then links to social environment. So I think there's a lot of work to do in this area and a huge opportunity for talent and professional development within payment firms. 
Okay. We all have biases and we know that's a challenge during the hiring process, but what do you see companies doing to help remove some of those biases? And then the second part is, do you help them with this? Yeah, we try and do. I had some very early experiences on what I thought was really good objective behavior, trying to overcome bias, which was from GE Consumer Finance in the 90s in the UK, where rather than just promoting people that they thought were good for the next role internally, they would bring in an external partner, an external recruitment company, just to make sure that they were benching the requirements of the role against the availability of resources in the market and opening themselves up to any other talent that they should be considering to bring into their environment. So I felt that was a very good thing. That was happening a long time ago. And I'm I'm beginning to see some companies begin to replicate that. I think opening the searches up to wider geographies and parallel sectors where new talent can be found will increase innovation, upskilling, and broaden of the cultural DNA. So I think the the extreme growth that we're seeing in the payment sector per se and the kind of natural forces there on saying talent is becoming scarce is actually a good outcome because it's forcing organizations to look more broadly than just the types of people that they know and feel comfortable with. And therefore, I'm, I'm beginning to see clients become more open, unbiased and, and objective to where people could, could come in from. I also think at the back end, one of the ways in which they're trying that clients are often very brave at the outset, they'll follow our guidance where we want them to be more creative and look more broadly or look deeper, multiculturally, cross-border or in different channels. But you then find very often or used to find as you went through a process, there'd be a tightening up. And by the time you got to shortlist, all that brave talk and creative talk up front got lost. And when they came to shortlist, they just hired people from the companies that they felt really comfortable with. And I think one of the ways I've seen them overcome that is by good stakeholder management in terms of the delivery of the search firm in, keeping those stakeholders from the brief accountable for what they wanted you to do all the way through your process, but very importantly, making sure they've got a good diversity of people in the final selection panel from the organization so that they can actually secure the creativity that they talked about when we actually briefed. And there's very good evidence there if one can deliver in that way and they can hold true to what they were prepared to at the launch of the brief, then you can very often secure the left of field candidate or somebody from a slightly wider background. Right, right. And it's kind of a good segue into the next question is, as you well know, people like to hire from their networks, which ends up being people that look and act just like they do. And obviously, as an executive search firm, you have your network. So how do you overcome that challenge of just using your network where you end up sort of with the same kind of candidates over and over? Yeah. And I think it's really important differentiation here across search firms. I would say this, but it's one of the reasons I set up Greenings, in that I would ask clients to call on their preferred search firms to demonstrate a robust and transparent process. And what do I mean by that? Yeah, we have a network. I have a strong international network, and I'm very proud of it. But do we use that network to keep placing that network and closing searches quickly? Or do we use it as a springboard to actually find new and interesting and relevant people? And I think that's the difference. So using your research teams that I call it fresh desk research. And whenever we start an assignment, clearly there'll be a group of people we know that we will go to as influencers in that space or around that sort of function. But that must just be a starting point. And so driving your research teams to actually use that to get referred into new live candidates, rather than I'm afraid there's a lot of behavior out there still where some of those big firms will just use the best people they have sitting on a database or in their black books to solve client hiring requirements. That's not helpful to anyone. But as coming back to the sort of scarcity of talent in payments, I think they're being forced now to actually demonstrate that they can do fresh desk research. So I think we need to see clients testing the search firms, requesting evidence really around How successful are the placements they make? How long do they last in the organizations? And I think also from a search perspective, 
what's the level of repeat business of a search firm with that client? How long have those consultants in those search firms been in the firms where they've got that, that orientation and best practice to go find new people and to, frankly, innovate their shortlists? So the downside of that is I think we see UK and US firms want the cheapest and fastest route to placement. So I don't think we can blame the recruitment firms every time. I think there is a a strong pressure from the client side to very often get there very quickly because it's often a requirement that hasn't been launched early enough. So there's always that catch-up factor. They want it done quickly. So who have you got available? Who's on your database without doing a full search? And particularly, I would say the US and the UK market, particularly the UK market, is incredibly price driven. So it's also about the cheapest route to hiring. And to my mind, that has the tendency to fuel bad practice or worse still leave the management to do their own thing with limited budget. So I advocate very strongly that we ask clients to look at more performance metrics on which recruitment functions and HR are based on. And by doing so, move away from this short-term get it placed, I can say to my boss, I got it placed quickly and I got it placed cheaply, but actually get it placed well and get it placed in a sustainable way where those people stay and then build careers in the organizations that we've put them into. Right. And you've been in this industry, meaning payments as well as executive search for roughly 20 years. How do you think the payments industry is doing on this topic of diversity and inclusion? So I think it's an industry that's been forced into disruption. If I've seen how in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, it's really shifted from being that back office part of a bank and a processing environment to something that's now directly connected to consumers. So broadly in financial services, I think there's been a huge degree of disruption. And with that, more of a requirement on those organizations to consider more diverse shortlists from other sectors, from other geographies. The talent, as we've said, is in short supply. So I think we are seeing more creativity and more openness in the hiring considerations. I think the other thing that's really important is in the last few years, you've got people coming into payments that are beginning to see payments as a career. And this is a really important changing point. And if you allow me to put AI and fintech into payments for a while, I think these are the first sorts of organizations and disciplines where we're getting youngsters straight out of universities who see a career in data around AI, for example. And so all of a sudden, there's an entry point early on opening itself, therefore, to a much more diverse employee group. And what we've got to see, I've got some clients who are beginning to focus on this and are interested in this, but we've got to see more organizations willing to train and professionally develop people in payments. So a bit like when I joined the bank from school, instead of going to university, I knew I had to go and get my Institute of Bankers and I went off and studied. I think the payments industry is getting to a point where if it can now offer some sort of framework to youngsters wanting to build a career who may have come from an unconventional education background, then there is a route. And by doing so, I think we'll bring in a lot of talent and will overcome a lot of these succession issues where there are big holes of experience in organizations because they're not able to bring people through. So I think the the career piece is really important for me, getting people young. The other, I think, what payments industry is doing well is the DNI forums, raising the profile. We're seeing many more people discuss this in focus groups, whether it's WNET, whether it's women in payments. That's a good profile-raising engagement with the industry, and that's been very positive to see over the last three or four years. In our own experience, we're placing around 40% women for senior roles. We're moving people across Europe to the US and vice versa. We're bringing people from South America into Spain and mainland Europe. That international mobility is really important. So I see that trend continuing, which is really driven ultimately by the growth of the payments industry. Yeah, it's interesting because it's a good segue into the next question. Can you talk about D&I from a more global perspective? Like most of what we've been talking about is kind of US and UK based, but obviously you have much more experience across the globe. Kind of compare regions or countries and how, what are the differences and who's doing well and who has some catching up to do that kind of talk? No, for sure. Yeah, we do a lot of work now in the Middle East, which we weren't doing 10 years ago. We've always been pan-Europe. And as you say, we've got a balance book of business between 
North America and, and Europe anyway. I think I would still say that the regional trends appear to be quite sharp and distinct between them. As I've just said, we are seeing much more international mobility at middle and senior levels. As I believe that the big firms, the big search firms focus on the local office and regions and the people they know, and hopefully the pressure on them to deliver this talent will mean that they'll stop slowing down the globalization of what is occurring in in the talent space. I think as I view Middle East, for example, very often, as is the case, not only with technology, but I think it's happening culturally, some of the best practice is coming out of some of the emerging countries. So arguably, some of the more mature economies have got their ways and methods of recruiting and doing and developing people. And I'm actually seeing a lot of very positive effort come out of the Middle East, which you would have said culturally would have been quite different from a DNI perspective when compared with, with Western Europe or even America. We're doing a lot of work down in Africa, and there's some really good practice down there occurring around DNI. So some of the emerging markets, I think, are places to watch. I think Canada is doing really well. Canada is also investing incredibly heavily in AI around the Toronto space, for example. And with that, I think we'll bring a much richer and more diverse group of people into the market. So I think it's really encouraging, but maybe some of the more mature markets are the ones that actually need to work harder at changing. Yeah, and you said something earlier that I want to dive into a little bit is that the fintechs, the younger companies that are sort of disrupting the traditional payments industry are naturally and maybe you didn't say this, maybe I'm making this up, but that they seem to bring to the table more diversity naturally. Can you speak to that? Like, I mean, that makes sense, right? Totally makes sense. But it really says, hey, we've got this gap between these young people, young companies, startups, fintechs, disruptors, and the traditional big companies. There seems to be this gap. Like, how do we We can't wait 20 years for these folks to be in senior level positions. Like, how do we, as someone who's out there talking to these companies who's recruiting every day, how do we fill that gap or how do we change that dynamic or can it be changed? Yeah, I think we see some very interesting examples from the major fuels. If you look at some of the the worldwide fuels brands at the moment, moving away from payments, but their whole business model is changing around, you know, (laughs) the world of oil and gas migrating into the sort of green energy spaces. And they're suddenly finding that they had some of the most sophisticated internal career development procedures where they only ever brought people in from the bottom and they could always fulfill their senior roles. You're finding last year and this year, they're all undertaking major external recruitment campaigns to hire people that traditionally they'd have never looked at, but the direction of their futures has changed out of all recognition. So I see that happening in financial services and in fintech. And the simple answer is we are seeing clients that are for the first time saying, look, our business, if we carry on as we are, just just fails to exist. And that we either succumb to disruptors coming in and gradually eating away at our client bases, or we have to plug in talent from sectors that we wouldn't normally go to. So I think that the software sector, the IT sector, we are spending more and more of our time. 10 years ago, we were going into the the telephony sector and bringing those people into payments. Now it's going on another level. We're bringing people out of software development and technology into very senior payment roles. There's enough internal expertise about payments and the regulation and those aspects. But what there isn't is in terms of What's the delivery of our solution to the market that's changing? And if we don't go and bring these people in that come from completely different backgrounds with different skill sets, we're just going to be completely alienated and those markets are going to run away from us. So there are some really difficult decisions being made amongst a number of our larger clients. As I say, we do a lot of work with private equity, and I would say it's the private equity firms that are coming in and acquiring businesses and then seeking to run those businesses in a different way as a platform, as a software business, rather than a bank or a financial services company. And they're just hiring in very different talent. A good example, we had a a client in the insurance space in the city of London a couple of years ago now that was, its market is changing within the insurance sector and it needed to bring in a head of analytics. 
And we ask them, do you want to go to insurance? Do you want to look in financial services? Where is the skill set? Where's the person going to fit your organization? And they said, no, we want you to go global and we want you to go to any sector. And we actually found an outstanding person in the Czech Republic in the pharmaceutical space who has now come in and very successfully two years on driving that business to huge growth and success in the AI space in insurance. And he knew nothing about insurance on the way in. But because he didn't, he bought new practices and he was able to help transform that business. Very interesting. You brought up something else that I want to drill into is the PE firms. I mean, obviously, there's been tons of investment in payments and fintech and tons of mergers and acquisitions and going public and all that happening in the industry. I don't feel like it's going to slow down this year or the following. A lot of it driven by PE firms. And since you mentioned them, do you feel like they're helping to push the diversity topic to their portfolio companies? Very interesting. Whether they're addressing the specific areas that we earlier described as being d and <laughs> I'm not sure whether they are directly going out to tick those boxes. But I think what is happening is that through the level of disruption they're seeking to bring and the pressure for turning around, merging the businesses that they're buying or heading towards a listing and an exit, they are being forced to look at very different non-traditional talent. So to a certain extent, there is an innovation of talent occurring in the organizations they grow because very often their ambitions for growth and eventually their own profitable exit are less and less met by people from the traditional payments businesses. So whilst I don't think it ticks all the DNI boxes, it is nevertheless disrupting and changing the shape and dynamic of the people that are coming in to run those businesses. But I would probably also go back to my earlier point there that compared with major corporates, compared with some of the public sector organizations, they don't give the time necessarily to those organizations to, in a thoughtful and careful way, implement a DNI strategy because there is a first and foremost focus around profit and around the growth of that business. And you and I, I think, understand that that can also be stronger with a very diverse group and makeup. I'm not sure that that is always achieved. Right, right. Well, Andrew, we've covered a lot of ground today. Very interesting discussion, and I really appreciate your time. Do you have any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to discuss before we leave the audience? Probably just a couple of things to leave you with, but I think something I sort of measure myself by is that make sure the processes that you're using, either as internal recruiters or as search professionals, make sure they're robust and diverse. And at the end of the day, never be detracted from hiring the best candidate for the job. I think people should create a, a positive culture to embrace DNI. And I think we'll see once people start to measure this properly that over time, people with the relevant processes and procedures around this and finding something that's suitable to their environment or their culture, those organizations will outperform a rigidly enforced environment. So I just implore people to give some time to it, give some budget to it and make sure that it's communicated from top to bottom in the organization. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate all your insights into this important topic. And again, thank you so much for your time. Greg, greatly appreciated. Very nice to speak with you. Thank you. That was Andrew Greening in this, the eighth episode of our special series on diversity and inclusion. The next episode will be available on February 18th. Without the support of our sponsors, WNET and Paysafe, we wouldn't be able to bring you this special series. Join WNET on February 23rd for the latest research on male allyship. In this webinar presented by WNET Advocate and Assistant Dean of Executive Education at the University of Arizona, Joe Corella, we will explore the neuroscience of allyship, best practices, and dig deeper into his focus group research for the payments industry. Go to WNETonline.org and select the events calendar to register for the Male Allies at Work, Unicorns or BFFs webinar. And Paysafe invites you to learn more about Paysafe, their offerings, international culture, and unique team by visiting paysafe.com. To learn more about the entire diversity and inclusion series, 
visit our website at leadersandpayments.com.